podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Samantha Carvalho. I am the Georgia Department of Community Affairs Chip Manager. And thank you all so much for attending this webinar. This is a webinar intended to explain the CHIP program and the application for the 2019 round. What I'd like for us to be able to accomplish today is to go over the CHIP program. I know many of you who are in attendance are familiar with this, but I'll just go over it really briefly so everyone understands what the program purpose is. And then I'll go over the application this year. I'll go over a couple of changes that we've made to the 28 from the 18 2018 um, application uh, from some listening sessions we did this summer. I'll do an overview of each of the application sections, what we'll be looking for to scoring and how you can get the best score in the application. And then I'll be sure to cover the submission instructions. So just first off, I just wanted to go over what the Georgia Department of Community Affairs does, for those of you who don't know. We're a state agency that uh, administers 65 programs. We have over 400 employees. We manage about $270 million in federal and state funds, and we provide a variety of services, affordable housing, community development, economic development, and planning to local governments. As far as the affordable housing activities go, we administer federal and state funding in the form of grants, bonds, and tax credits to develop multifamily rental property, to develop single family houses for home ownership, and to do owner-occupied home repairs. That's what the CHIP program activities are. We also provide housing counseling and certify housing counseling agencies. We provide a number of different down payment assistance uh, pro um, programs for homeowners in the state of Georgia. We provide rent assistance and rent assistance vouchers, and we provide funds directly to the homeless or to homeless shelters and service providers. As for the CHIP program, CHIP stands for the Community Home Investment Program. Home funds are a federal funding source from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. They are given to the state through a block grant program. There are about 12 different home recipients throughout the state, mostly in the metro areas. And then we administer the home funds for the state. We receive about $15 million a year. This year we had an increase of $23 million. And we use about a third of that for the CHIP program. The other two thirds of it go into our multifamily development programs. And we combine that with tax credits to do those developments. The uh, rules require that the beneficiaries of this program are homeowners or home buyers who make less than 80% of the average median income. This is not a direct beneficiary program. In other words, people cannot apply directly to the state to receive assistance for homeowner repairs or to get help buying a house. In this program, and this is why you're attending this webinar, it's an application program for local governments, nonprofits, and public housing authorities to apply for the funds, and then the state allocates those funds that way every year. We make about 10 to 15 grants per year. That's about half of what the applications are that we receive. Usually we, we have, in the last few years, received between 30 and 40 applications. The funding amount has um, varied from between 3 million and 7 million over the last few years. And over the last 20 years, we've distributed over 34 million to 400 households through this program. This is a snapshot of the grant recipients that have received CHIP awards for, for the last 10 years. We have um, a lot of distribution throughout the state, although there are some areas where we have not distributed funds in the last 10 years. The two programs that we, or the two activities that we fund are owner-occupied housing rehabilitation is one of them. Grantees can receive $300,000 to do owner-occupied home repairs or reconstructions, which would be when the house is in need of a full reconstruction. This is an example of a typical program that we might have seen where we have rehabbed a house in Sylvester with the Southwest Georgia Regional Commission. Many of the recipients of these funds are usually people who are elderly, who are living on a fixed income, have lived in their communities for a really long time and plan to stay in their homes, but they don't have the funds to do the repairs necessary to keep up their houses. 
a lot of times what we see are uh, HVAC repairs or in this case you can see that we um, installed a new heating and air conditioning system. Roof repairs are very common, um, improving windows and doors for energy efficiency, replacing floors and ceilings, especially if there's been roof damage, doing the plumbing and electrical upgrades that are necessary to bring things up to code, and we'll even replace kitchen cabinets and other things within the home. The other activity that we fund is single family housing development. With this, grantees can be awarded up to $600,000 to do new construction or rehabilitation of existing property, where you would acquire the property and then put it back on the market as affordable housing to eligible home buyers. This is an example of the Rusher Street neighborhood in the city of Washington. Washington used a com combination of CHIP, CDBG, and many other funding sources to accomplish this, where they redesigned an entire neighborhood and put in single family homes for sale to eligible home buyers. DCA's goals for the CHIP program are in line with our overall arching goals for um, DCA's assistance in the state. We are really looking to make sure that we're making good investments to communities that have a high capacity to carry out the activity. In other words, they are able to undertake the activities, home repairs, or the new construction within the federal guidelines. We have to justify that there is a need for these housing activities. Of course, throughout the state, there are many communities that are facing issues with their homeowners not being able to afford to fix up their homes or the need to build new affordable housing, but we need to make sure that we're allocating the funds in the communities that can justify the most need for the funds. And then lastly, we are very interested in supporting communities that are doing good planning so that these funds can be leveraged with other resources in order to allow us to, to make those funds go the farthest. So for now, I, I want to stop for a second and ask questions. Um, as you can see on the, the little strip of this webcast, there is a questions box, and you're welcome to write in your questions as we go along. I also wanted to point out that you should have access to two handouts. One is a printout of these slides that you can have, and then the other one is the application manual itself. So please feel free to write in questions as you go along. I, right now I don't see any questions, so I'll go ahead and move. But if you do have a question, please add it. And the next time we stop, I'll get to it. All right, so let's dig into the application itself. The application can be found on the CHIP website under this website here. You can also email me if you'd like a copy of it. We'll also make paper copies available if you need them as well. Just contact our office and we'll get that to you. The application was re released on September 4th and it's due December 5th. And I urge you to read the CHIP administration manual that's also within the CHIP website because this manual will tell you what is involved in the CHIP program after you're awarded funds. As I mentioned before, these are federal funds, so they come with a lot of different requirements. And if you're unfamiliar with the program, I strongly urge you to take a look at that and see what types of things you might have to, to do in order to meet the requirements for the grant. Here are a few changes from last year's application. These came about through some discussions over the summer with communities throughout the state. We did three listening sessions and we tried to meet with people to talk about what they thought were some improvements we could make to the application or just the CHIP program in general and also any issues they were having in, with affordable housing in their communities at large. And I encourage you to, to attend these next year. We'll try to get the word out in um, May and June and schedule them for July for you to attend. There were four significant changes. Uh, the first change is, um, is a pretty simple one. We in the past have done um, a three application or there were three types of ways that you could apply. You could apply for only on your owner occupied rehab activities or the new construction activity, um, or you could combine those two. We decided to ask communities to only apply for one activity or the other activity. So you would need, if you want to do both of them, you need to determine this year which one would be the priority for you and apply for those funds. Secondly, last year we allowed participating jurisdictions to apply, and I'll explain what a participating jurisdiction is. This year, participating 
jurisdictions are ineligible. Um, these are communities that receive home funds directly. And um, that's not to say that we wouldn't make them eligible in a, in a future year, but for this year, we're taking a pause on that. Uh, we have some great um, participating jurisdiction awardees that we're working with this year, so it doesn't have to do with that. Um, we just need to make sure that um, we're prioritizing the funding in the best way to, to assist the whole state. Um, the third change is that we have added um, some additional points within the geographic distribution section of the application. I'll go over that later. And then lastly, we are going to be providing bonus points to those grantees that are able through leveraging other resources to provide more housing. So for example, those applicants that can say they're going to do more housing rehabs or more new construction than other applications. And I'll go over that in more detail later on. So eligible applicants include cities and county governments that are not participating jurisdictions, public housing authorities, or nonprofits with 501c3 or c4 designation. Ineligible applicants are those current grantees. So these would be grantees receiving CHIP funds if they have more than 50% in unspent funds by December 1st. And the reason for this is because we um, need you to spend the money that you currently have before we'll give you more money. Um, and then, of course, the participating jurisdictions are also not eligible to apply this year. This is a list of the participating jurisdictions. These are the cities and counties within the state that receive home funds directly through the block grant program. And last year, we allowed them to apply, and we did get um, we did award funds to Albany and Augusta, and their programs are, are doing really well. And um, maybe in the next year, we'll, we'll open it up for PJs to apply. But right now, these particular areas will not be eligible to apply. So for the Housing Rehabilitation Program, I'm just going to go over this really briefly. Um, we will give $300,000 for housing rehab grants. And then the expectation is that you will be awarded up to $50,000 per home for home repairs. That $50,000 is to enable us to bring the home up to code, which is a requirement of the federal home funds. We also need you to do lead testing and abatement, if necessary, on those parts of the home that need to be repaired. Um, in addition, you would receive $4,000 per home in project delivery costs to cover your soft costs for this program and administering the program. Those of you who are familiar with this grant from previous years know that we used to give out an administration grant as well. Um, the way that that worked was it was a separate grant through the home program directly to you through our office. What we've done is we've eliminated that and we have instead increased the per house project delivery cost from 3,000 to 4,000 to cover what you would have received in administration. Um, I also wanted to point out with this, the way this program is designed, the, the homeowners themselves have, when they receive the assistance, they receive a lien on their property and it's made as a 0% five-year forgivable loan. So in other words, if they stay in their house for five years, they don't owe anything back. If they decide to sell their home within that five-year period, they may owe some of the money back. It'll be prorated to the amount of years they've been there. And um, it's dependent on how much money they may receive back from the sale of their house. If they transfer the ownership to a family member that meets the other home requirements, the income requirements in particular, that person will take on that lien for the remaining years. Um, so generally speaking, we've given out, as I mentioned, millions of dollars over the course of the years of these programs, and we never really receive any funds back. We Maybe 99% of the time we don't get any money back. So well, we want to make sure that homeowners know what they're getting themselves into when they participate in this program. For the single family development grants, we will give grantees $60,000 to do the construction. We'll do $5,000 in home, uh, I'm sorry, project delivery costs, 15% or up to $20,000 for the developer's fee. And then we'll provide a home buyer subsidy to lower the sale price from the appraisal for up to $14,999. Um, that is the limit set to be below the five year lien period. And um, and so um, 
So it works similarly to the housing rehab program, except that they would owe that money back when they sold their house. It's not forgivable over the time frame. Um, one of the nice things about this program is that any funds that you receive after the sale of the home, you can put into a fund to reuse for more affordable housing activities as long as they fall within the home guidelines. So you could use this to, to do more housing production or you could do owner-occupied rehab with it or down payment assistance. The other thing I need to point out to you is that under the home rule, these houses must be sold to an eligible home buyer within nine months of construction or it reverts to rental property that you'll have to manage as rental. So I know that I've gone over the, uh, this pretty quickly. I'm going to take a break real quick and read some of the questions that you've sent in. Let me see what it says. Okay, so the first question says, can our project include both new construction and reconstruction of units? Yes, that's correct. So if you wanted to apply for the $600,000 for this single family development grant, you could do a mix of developing onto uh, a vacant lot. So you acquire the lot with no house on it and then put a new home on it. You could also use those funds to, to purchase a home in need of repair and rehab it and then put it back on the market. And you can do a combination of both of those things. The distinction is with the beneficiary. So the owner-occupied rehab is for homeowners who are already in their homes, and the single-family development grant is for people who are going to become home buyers to acquire those properties as you put them on the market. So the next question is, oh, I'm sorry. Somebody said that I answered their question. Um, if a PJ is part of a GIC team, is it still ineligible? For example, a grantee in Gwinnett County that is a GIC community, can they apply for a CHIP? So um, this is a question that relates to um, GIC, which I'll go into later. GIC is the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing. It's a planning program. Um, unfortunately, we are not allowing grants uh, applicants. Well, you can apply, but we would not award funding to um, grantees that are within a participating jurisdiction. So that would mean both the government itself and the applicant cannot apply if your community is a participating jurisdiction in the home program, which would exclude Gwinnett, unfortunately. Okay, so let's go, go back to the presentation and let's get right into scoring. The application is 100 points total. The majority, well, half of the points are in capacity. So in other words, your experience with managing similar activities. It doesn't mean experience with CHIP necessarily, but we do need to know that you have had some experience with this type of activity in the past. And then also your readiness to proceed because we um, do these grants for only a two-year grant term. So we want to make sure that you are ready to go once you get the award. Um, we, the next category is need. Uh, that's 20 points. Planning is 20 points. Um, and then leverage resources is 10 points. Those would be your match funds. And I'll go over each one of these in detail. So the first section is very simple. It's the general information. This tells us who you are, what your activity, are, activity is, and what your proposed budget is. I did put a tip here that please be sure to list the appropriate contact person that we can ask for questions about the application. And then um, we have a section in there asking if you are going to be contracting with a grant administrator. Many of our local governments um, hire grant administrators who have a lot of experience with the CHIP program to do these grants for them so that they don't have to do the, the program in-house. And if you would like to talk to us about some potential um, companies and nonprofits or regional commissions that have had experience with CHIP in your area and you'd like a recommendation, please contact us and we'll see if we can put you in touch with somebody that we've worked with. So section two is the capacity and project readiness section. Uh, we ask for your, your communities or your applicants' experience. So if your local government, if your local government has had experience doing this activity in the past, then we ask for staff experience. And the distinction is because 
in the case where you might be hiring a grant administrator, your city or county or nonprofit or public housing authority may have not ever pursued a program like this where you've done unoccupied rehab or new development, but the person that you're hiring to help you with it has. And so we um, will give you points in either one of the, we'll give you points in both of them. Project readiness, um, there is a section in the, the manual that goes over a list of qualified staff and consultants, and I'll cover that in a later slide. And then for those applications that are doing acquisition, new construction, and reconstruction, we also ask for you to give us some idea of your construction plans. I'll cover that too. So under project readiness, in the application for owner-occupied rehab, what we're looking for are, are people or businesses that you either have under contract or intend to contract with that can provide the necessary can, um, work on the job. So um, your building inspector, what are the building inspector's qualifications? Do you already have a lead inspector that you're gonna be working with who's EPA certified? Have you developed a list of qualified contractors to be able to provide the owner occupied rehab? Will you already be working with a real estate appraiser who could do the appraisals, which is a necessary part of the, of the program? And then the, the manual lists some other examples too. Under the new construction or reconstruction of homes for sale application, uh, we will require that the home buyers have some kind of pre-purchase counseling before they go into the house. So do you already have, are you already working with a nonprofit or an organization that can provide pre-purchase counseling? And um, we can help you to get a list, if you'd like, of these uh, agencies in your area um, because DCA does certify that. Do you have realtors or builders that you can work with on this program too? Um, and there are more examples in the manual. For the new construction, construction plan section of the application, I wanted to point out that HUD requires that you don't do any choice limiting activities before you're awarded the funds and before you pass the environmental review requirements for the grant. So what we don't want you to do is to um, put yourself in the position of having a pending sale contract before you have the award. And even furthermore, before we verify that the property that you're about to buy isn't gonna violate one of the HUD required environmental review standards. However, we do want to see what you have in mind. So if there's an area in your community that, for example, might be managed by or um, owned by the land bank authority or um, that you have some kind of idea that you would be able to purchase the property um, or if you even have site control. Those are the things that are going to get you the most points in this section. We also want to know what the current property value is and if we're going to be investing the funds to acquire the property. We want an idea of what you have in mind for the houses themselves and we don't want you to send us blueprints or anything like that but if you have an idea of what the house is going to look like, what the size of it is going to be, um, we ask you to provide a, a market study in this application too. So we want you to know, do you want to put in housing that's going to be um, three bedrooms, two baths, or, or what it is that you think that is the need in your community for this afford, new affordable housing. So we'll be able to see in your plans what kind of housing you want to put in. Um, your financing plans, if you have other resources that you're going to be putting into this. If you could send us pictures of the vacant land or, or adjacent property within the neighborhood, and then if you're putting in housing in an historic neighborhood and um, we would just like to make sure that whatever your plans are, are going to meet the requirements of your local historic preservation office. So if that's necessary, you could in include a, um, a letter or something like that that will let us know that you're not going to be stuck in the position of not being able to move forward on this project because you're facing resistance from your historic preservation community. Um, so I'm going to stop again here for some questions. Let me see what what we have. Okay, so so far I haven't received any other questions, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward. All right, so the third section is need. So uh, the need for this activity in your community. The first section, we want you to identify your target area. Um, we do award points to grants to applicants that have not received a grant 
Um, that's because we want to make sure that we are spreading these funds out throughout the state. So you will receive points if you haven't received the award in one year, three years, or five years. Um, under the geographic priority, this is where I said earlier that we added a point. We are asking you if you are in a federally declared disaster area that has been declared since 2015 to note that so we can get the point there. And then also we have um, a DCA designation, which is transformational communities, where we're trying to invest some of our resources. And it's listed in the manual. If you're in one of those communities, you'll receive a point for that too. Also under the needs section is we want you to list the poverty rate for the target area. Uh, if you have a higher poverty rate, then you'll get a higher score for owner-occupied rehab applications. If you have a lower rate, you'll receive a higher rate for new construction, reconstruction, for sale to eligible home buyers. And the reason for that is this is because we want to put new housing in places that are unaffordable and that offer uh, quality amenities, good jobs, and quality uh, educational opportunities for the people buying the homes. Um, we, uh, we also split up the application in the owner-occupied rehab application. You're going to do Section D, Current Housing Conditions, in which you'll take pictures of the property. And I, I think I have a slide coming up for that one, so I'll take a pause on that. And then under Section D in the other application, we were asked for your market analysis, and I'll cover that in more detail, too. So as I said, for current housing um, conditions, what we're trying to, to make sure that you can answer for us is, is there a need for owner-occupied rehab in your target area? We want you to provide a narrative of the, the housing conditions in the area and um, some kind of a picture of what the community looks like. You can take photos of representative houses. And um, I highlighted the word representative because I want to make sure it's clear that we're not asking you to take pictures of houses that you um, are definitely going to do once they're awarded. Um, in the CDBG application, if you're familiar with that, we ask you to identify those houses in advance. Because of the number of applications we receive and that we don't get an opportunity to fund everybody, we really don't want you to be put in the position of asking homeowners to go into their houses or take pictures of their houses if it turns out that they won't be helped with this program. We would prefer that you take pictures of representative houses um, maybe you have houses or you have people on a waiting list or you've done other outreach. That's okay, too, um, just so that we get an idea of what you would be working with. For the other application for the new construction or reconstruction of homes to sell to eligible home buyers, we're needing you to provide for us a real estate market analysis. Um, the question we'll have for you is, should the state invest in creating single-family affordable housing in your area? Um, you'll have to make a strong case for why there isn't that housing already, that you don't have an adequate supply of affordable housing, and so you would need state funding to build new houses. So what we want to see is that you can demonstrate that the current housing stock doesn't meet the demand, that the sale prices are not affordable for homeowners or home buyers who make 80% of the average median income for your area. Uh, but we also want to see that it's a neighborhood that we want to put new housing in because it'll provide good resources for the homeowners who move into them. So we want to see positive neighborhood characteristics. And we also want to see, if possible, that this activity complements other redevelopment activities in your area. And that's really covered in planning also. So I'm going to pause for questions again and see if there are any here. Um, let's see. It doesn't look like we're getting any other questions. I'm not sure if this is because, I'm assuming that's because there's no one has any questions, but if you are having trouble using this, you're welcome to email me and I will answer your question when I get to my email. Okay, so then for the section for planning, uh, we are, um, we're looking at two different things in this one. Whether you're participating in the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing, which is the GIG program, and we want you to provide an affordable housing plan if you have one that you already have in place in your community. So just to go over GIG really quickly, this is a program that DCA partners with University of Georgia and Georgia Municipal Association and Georgia Power. 
each year we bring on five new communities to participate. It isn't a grant program. It is a program that provides free technical assistance through two retreats per year over three years. So the, um, the participants go to the retreats, they meet with their housing team, which might be local government officials, people who work within the industry, neighborhood association members, anyone who's working on affordable housing in their community, and they meet with a facilitator and they develop a set of goals. And they also attend a series of, of presentations from experts in the state and other good communities that have gone through the program on topics such as how to have better code enforcement for blighted property, how to, how to create a land bank authority, how to access DCA funding like this program and the low income housing tax credits and a variety of different issues that we see come up time and time again throughout the state. This is a great program to get everyone in the same room over a period of three years to really tackle these. And it's inspirational to see the presentations from communities that have gone through them, to see what they've tried, what challenges they've had, and how things have worked out. So I strongly encourage you to look into this. I can give you more information. You can email me later if you want to participate in this program. But if you are in the program or if you're an alumni of the program, you will get points in the application for participating in the program. We also ask you to give us your affordable housing plan if you have one. Uh, we're not asking for a specific planning document. There's a lot of planning documents that communities may have, but we do have a set of criteria for whatever planning document you do send us, that your local government has adopted the plan, that there was some kind of public input process to determine your goals for your affordable housing in your community, that it's less than four years old. However, if it is less, if it's more than four years old, that's fine as long as you have a comment about why or why, why it has, if it has been updated and reviewed within the last four years, or why it may not have needed to be. Um, we want to see that the target area you've identified in this chip application appears in this plan, that is a part of your overall strategy, and that your grant goals, such as um, the two activities for chip, are also something that is in your plan. So let me break for questions again. Okay. So no questions yet. All right. So this is the last section I want to cover. Uh, this leverage resources isn't a separate section within the application, but it, it's at the beginning and match. But I wanted to cover it because it's really important. We do give points to communities that provide match, but I want to say that match is absolutely not required for this grant. We will give you the home funds directly without you having to provide any cash or any in-kind support, and that could be land, the, the value of the land, let's say, if that's going to be donated oh, so that we don't have to use our funds to acquire the property. If you're going to be waiving any permits to allow for the construction, that can be counted as match. Anything that your staff are providing that would otherwise have to be paid for through the grant, you can count as match. And there's a section in the application manual that covers this in more detail. Um, so the more you provide in, the, the more points you'll receive. And then the other thing I wanted to point out was this new thing with the bonus points for this, this year's grant application. We will be ranking applications based on how many units that they provide, either how many houses they intend to rehab or how many houses they intend to build. And um, those applications will receive a rank score. And that's covered in the scoring section of the manual as well. All right, so lastly, the submission requirements. Um, the deadline is December 5th. You are welcome to ask questions or uh, set up a conference call to go over your application ideas or questions you may have about scoring anytime. Um, we did not set a set limit for that or a blackout period for, for communicating with you before the application. But just as a courtesy for us, if you would try to get all of your uh, questions and, and um, if you want to set up a conference call before Thanksgiving, that would really help us a lot. Uh, last year, we had a lot of last minute questions and it was really hard to feel that we were giving everyone as much um, attention as we thought we needed. 
Um, we, we put out the application as a PDF, but you're, and you, we would like for you to ask us for a Word version of the file, so it'll just be a little easier for you to fill out. So please email us. You can email the, the CHIP email address here for the application in Word. You will need to submit everything as PDFs by email to the CHIP email application by the deadline. Um, what you'll see in the application manual is that each section may have an attachment requirement that just gives us more detail. For example, if we're asking for your experience, we'll ask for a narrative of more, with more detail about your experience managing program. So you would attach that as a PDF. And um, each of the attachments in the manual, there's instructions for how you want to label them. This really helps us a lot because once we get the application in and score them, we divide them up to the scoring team and each scoring team will take sections of your application. So it's really important that you follow the directions and label these appropriately so that we can have, it'll be easier for us to process them once we receive them. Um, I will say that there is a 10 megabyte attachment limit to your emails. I don't think this should be a problem for most of these. There may be an issue with maybe your housing plan if you have a very substantial, substantial document with a lot of graphics and um, you may want to take a look at the attachment sizes that you have and you can condense them. If you have any questions about the technical part of submitting things, please do ask. At least try to test these out before the deadline to make sure that you can get them in. Because what we don't want to have happen is that you think you're sending something and it doesn't get into our inbox. Um, I will say that after you apply, after December 5th, we will send you an email responding that says we've received it with any comments about things that we might be missing, so we can clean that up, but we would need it immediately because we don't want to give you a lot of time to, um, to work on things that would be unfair to the other applicants. The, the application requires a $250 application fee. This you need to mail to us by check, and the mailing instructions and who you need to write the check out to are in the application manual. Um, these need to be mailed and postmarked by the December 5th deadline. So what happens next? So after December 5th, you will receive your uh, email saying that we received your application. Then DCA staff will score the applications between December and March. We will make our awards in March and we will send out um, award letters to you and your grant administrators and um, put a press release in the, in the local papers. Um, we will do awardee training in April to go over the grant and we'll do our contracting with you April through July. The grant term for this is August 1st, 2019 through July 31st, 2021. You'll have two years to accomplish this. So I wanted to point out the grant activity start date of August 1st so that you know that if you need to, to think about um, acquiring property, that you would, the anticipation is that as long as you met the requirements for environmental reviews after you're awarded, that you would be able to close in August on that property. This is my contact information. My name is Samantha Carvalho. Again, these um, chip emails go directly into my inbox. You're welcome to call me at any time. Um, the chip website is below, and um, this presentation will be has, is being recorded, and it will be posted online, and we will share it on our website after we post it. So let me just make sure that there aren't any other questions. Okay, let me see what these questions say. All right, so um, somebody asked, could you please go over the property rate formula for new construction? It sounds as if we need to build new construction units in neighborhoods with the lower poverty rates. That's actually incorrect. We, we are asking you to build properties in the, yes, I'm sorry, I just confused myself, the lower property rates, that is correct. So if your community um, is, a, a, is not a, a high poverty rate, then you'll get a higher score. So 
we're looking at putting in property into middle income neighborhoods, not low income neighborhoods, if that makes sense. So just to say it again, so it's not unclear, um, we expect that you'll be doing your owner occupied home repairs in communities that have a high poverty rate. So lower income communities for the owner occupied home repair application. We want to see you put new construction of houses or acquire properties to be reconstructed and sold to home buyers in higher income neighborhoods. The idea being that there aren't affordable housing in those neighborhoods and so we're trying to put them in there. All right, so um, another question, is the URP and DCA designated revitalization areas considered affordable housing plan docs? Do you want the whole document or relevant pages? So that's a really good question. So thank you, Rhonda, for asking it. Um, those plans uh, would be sufficient for the affordable housing plans if they meet the requirements, those five standards that I, I said earlier. Um, we didn't, we're not asking you to develop an entirely new plan to apply for this program. We do want the whole document. I think what would be great is if you wanted to put a memo in there explaining where we can find the relevant information so it's a lot easier for us to read it. That would be very, very helpful. But we do want to see the whole document. Now, if the document is too big and you feel like it would be more relevant to just include a housing section of a larger um, planning document, for example, if you have a comprehensive plan and um, you want to just send us the housing element, that might be an appropriate way of handling it. So you would reference the bigger document and send us the section having to do just with housing. And again, this might be something you just need to ask on a case-by-case -case basis for us to explain. If you want to say, this is the plan we want to use, will this work? I'd be happy to look at that before the application is due. All right, so another question. I have a question about bringing rehab housings up to code. Um, it looks like it cut off there, but so the question about bringing housing, rehab housing up to code. Um, this is an important distinction between our program and maybe some other grant programs. We would love to make this a program where we could provide smaller amounts of funding per house to do things such as building wheelchair ramps or other, other smaller repairs to people's homes like weatherization or just replacing roofs or just replacing heating and air conditioning. But under the home grant, is required that we address all the code issues of the house, which means a lot of times the houses, the cost of the construction can be around 50,000. In some cases, we're seeing higher amounts too. Um, and so what that means bringing up to code would be the standard codes in place for the state of Georgia. And then if you need more detail about this, we do have some written program policies that address codes and standards, and I can send that to you so you can review them if you'd like. Okay, another question is, if a community gets bonus points for the highest number of proposed units, will they be penalized if they do not construct that number of units? Well, of course, we would want you to meet all of the requirements, I mean, um, to, to have a good, reasonable financing plan in place. Um, in some cases, that's not possible. So what happens sometimes is, we have communities who apply for the owner-occupied rehab grant, and let's say they estimate they'll do six houses at $50,000 a piece, um, using up the whole $300,000 for the grant. And then you end up with one house where you have a very needy homeowner, and you make the decision you want to help them with more money, which means there'll be less money available for somebody else. You might be able to select a home that is less expensive to do, so there's less of a need, or maybe it was built um, is a newer home, so it doesn't need the lead paint testing and other things that might drive up the cost in order to balance it out and meet your goal. We are not going to hold fast to, um, to this specific number and penalize you if two years down the road you end up not being able to do as much because you don't have as much funding in there. Um, however, what we don't want you to do is to have an unrealistic expectation that you'll be able to do, let's say, 10 houses, but you don't have the matched funds in order to enable that to happen. Um, I think what we're going to see is that those bonus points are probably going to align themselves very closely with the match points so that communities who are providing more match may also be able to do more units because they just have more funds in order to do it. Um, as for new construction, um, of course, this is going to be, it's going to be very important that you have a good financing plan for this. 
So if you intend to build, let's say, four houses, then you should be able to, to finish that. Um, it shouldn't be a um, it shouldn't be the same sort of situation as with owner occupied rehab, where down the road you you all of a sudden all your costs are completely different from what you expect it to be. Um, we're really looking for communities to do some homework in advance to try to determine what they think would be reasonable and what they could possibly accomplish. So you could talk to some people about what you think the housing costs may be, um, what the the prices for the the land acquisition may be, what it might cost to, to demo a house and rebuild it or just do the renovations before you, you contact us. And give yourself a lot of leeway too. Make sure you've got a, a cushion of funds um, so that if you go over 10% or under 10%, then you're still within what you say that you're going to do. I hope that that was helpful. Okay, so let's see, another question that came in. Okay, this one says, can we send a link to a OneDrive folder and it be more than the MB or do the applications, oh, megabytes, or do the applications attachments need to be attached directly to the email? We would prefer, thank you, Sherry, for your question. We would prefer that you can send them directly through the email. If you find that the it is too big, we may help let you um, put it into a, um, a folder and send it to us, but I don't expect there to be a reason for you to have to do that. We want to be able to let you get these documents to us. Um, there might be a way to compress the file. Um, the reason why we don't want to go with the Dropbox or OneDrive or other options is that it's just a little bit more work on our end to get them in and um, upload them into our system. Um, but if there's no other way to do it, we will work with you on it. But we don't want to get everyone's applications that way because it would be really tricky for us to, to then process them and download them and put them into our folders here to review. Assume, this is another question. Assuming that we have site control, can we proceed with the environmental review prior to August 1st, i.e. in anticipation of an award so that we are shovel ready? Well, that would be great um, if you are already familiar with the environmental review process. And I want to make sure I point out that this is not a phase one environmental review that you have to pay for. Um, we can send you the information about what the requirements are for environmental review if you'd like to take a look at it. Generally speaking, we are we don't want to demolish historic property. We don't want to build housing in the airport clear zones or on toxic land or, or within a very noisy location. We don't want to build in wetlands or coastal barrier areas or floodplains. Um, there are a number of different statutes that are required, and I can send you a list so you can take a look at it. Um, as far as the timing goes, what you would most likely be able to do in this case, Harold, is if we give you the award in March, you can proceed to start looking at the environmental statutes and have all of those cleared so that you can begin August 1st, provided that we get notification from HUD that, they, that everything has been cleared. It often takes a couple of months to go through the environmental review process on a, on a big project. Um, and, and sometimes we can clear it in house. It just depends on the type of applicant we have. And I don't wanna go into a lot of detail about this here. If you have specific questions about that, you're welcome to email me about them. And then another question, can you exceed 50,000 per home for repairs? Um, yes, you can. What we do is we have a process where you, if you do anticipate that it's going to be more expensive than 50000 you can send us a letter explaining why it's going to be more expensive. And we often will accept those and and um, and tell you, yes, you're, you're able to proceed as long as you have a good cost estimate of the repairs and there's a good justification for why those repairs would be more expensive. All right, it looks like I have covered everybody's questions, but I'm going through it right now just to see if there are any more. And I really appreciate these questions. It's very helpful for us to make sure that everybody understands the application process. If you go back to your office and you start to discuss this with other people, please be sure to give me a call or email me and I'd be happy to set up a conference call or anything else that you need to better understand the process. And with that, I'm going to close this out. We are just under the one hour time frame for this. Again, I really appreciate all of you for attending and we look forward to getting your applications in. 
who hope to have a very productive 2019 CHIP grant award. So thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing from you soon.